All righty. Hello, uh, I am Bob Rako, an editor at Shaw Media Local News Network. Today is September 10, and we're having an interview, a joint interview with candidates for the 47th Legislative District in the November election. I'm joined today by Jim Slusher uh, of the Daily Herald. This is a uh, joint collaborative effort between Shaw and the Herald uh, doing the endorsement interviews. And we welcome the candidates, incumbent Democrat Tara Costa Howard, her Republican opponent, Peter Breen. We uh, welcome you both. We appreciate you both taking the time. Um, as we've done with some of the other races, I thought we would just offer both of you a couple minutes to make an opening statement. Uh, perhaps, Peter, you'd like to start. Sure. Well, and I'll tell you, uh, the main reason that I am running again for public office is the what I've seen that the terrible uh, struggle that folks are having remaining in Illinois. You know, uh, my wife and I were, were privileged to be able to bring home a, a little baby, you know, 12 days before the last general election. You know, we got the call to come get your baby. And as we brought him back a few days later, you know, we came back into the state and I wondered as I passed that sign that said, welcome to Illinois on I-94 as you're driving in from Indiana. You know, I, seeing that sign and going, what am I bringing him back to? You know, am I bringing him back to the place that I came to? my family came to in 1986 to DuPage County to Naperville, where the world was my oyster. Uh, you know, we came here and we found incredible economic opportunity, educational opportunities, safe schools and streets and everything. I mean, it was just brimming uh, with life. And so uh, that I'm very worried about when I see so many people leaving our state feeling they have to go. Uh, whether due to the property tax burden. Uh, some folks just got sick of the corruption. You know, my own brother-in-law, uh, I remember you know, he and his wife and, and their little girl, Lucia, who, who would play with Matthew, our, our little four-year-old, you know, they left, it was right also before the last election. And he said to me, he said, I just don't see a future for myself. And now he and his family are in Florida and he's got a great job, low property taxes, they bought a house. And I'm, I'm seeing this over and over and over again from people, and it's not right. Uh, in Illinois, we've got the best people, we have the resources, we've got transportation hubs. I mean, we've got everything you need, except for the fact of our broken government. That's the thing that's holding us back from just exploding with opportunity, economic and otherwise. Uh, and so that is something that I'm trying to fight to bring back. So I've, I've taken the, the motto for this campaign, clean house, rebuild Illinois. And so that's really, that's really the jux, uh, you know, that's the, the crux of what I've been doing. Obviously, I've been at this for 10 years now from when I first ran for the Lombard Village Board. And so you've seen, I've got a record. I've been able to get these things done. I've been able to make changes, practical changes uh, in ways that nobody else could, you know, uh, froze property taxes in Lombard first time in 20 years, got rid of the village vehicle sticker tax. Uh, you know, nobody had ever done that before. And, and, you know, and a host of things in the legislature, et cetera. So 32 bills passed into law more than any other legislator of my uh, same term, first term and second term. Uh, so you look at that, you've got a record. Uh, I am, you know, I'm also disappointed, of course, at uh, my current state representative. Uh, a lot of folks uh, thought that, you know, she had promised them at the door that she'd vote against Madigan, told him she'd be independent of Madigan, and then flipped around, voted for him, took a million and a half from the guy, and, you know, sat quiet as we had the, the rape cover up and all of this. Uh, and even after the ComEd prosecution came forward, uh, you know, we did the if true thing. And then only a couple of weeks later, uh, when she realized that I, I was going to win this election, if she didn't, you know, tossed him aside. And then since then, though, we're seeing reports of uh, uh, campaign spending and, and she's accepting, you know, all the money from Madigan and she's back on the Madigan program. So, you know, guys, I mean, the, the terms of the race were set probably two years ago. And we've only kind of the things I promised two years ago, they've all now come true. Uh, you know, we had our forum, Legal Women Voters, last night. We had an hour-long forum, and the words corruption, Madigan, ComEd did not come out of the representative's mouth. We had plenty of time to talk about it. So, look, you got somebody who's back on the Madigan program, and we can talk more about it. But that's really, those are the terms of the race. Well, thank you. Um, that was a question that I had planned to, to bring up later, but um, representative, you can either make an introductory statement, or if you just wanted to respond to, to what Mr. Breen has said, that's be perfectly fine as well, your choice. I'll do a little of both if that's okay with you. Fine, up to you. 
So um, as you know, my name is Tara Costa Howard and I am the state representative for the 48th district here in DuPage County. Um, I wanna thank the Daily Herald for their endorsement in 2018. And I've done my very best to live up to, um, uh, I've done my very best to live up to the faith that you placed in me um, in 2018, as well as the voters. Um, I've been a legislative leader. I have passed bills that impact directly our communities. I took a stand and closed the property tax loophole um, regarding the DuPage County Airport. And that, of course, came after investigative reporting from the Daily Herald, who highlighted that loophole, and I was able to close it. I worked hard with my other community, um, my local community legislators, to pass the hotel motel tax um, abatement process that um, directly impacts Lombard and Lyle, um, non-home rural communities in, in my district. They're able to use those dollars in a way that they had never been able to do before because you we didn't get that passed, but we got that passed within months of me being there. I also passed a human trafficking bill, again, working alongside with the Illinois Hotel Motel Association to keep people safe. Those were great bills that we were able to pass under my leadership as well. And as you know that I was the chief sponsor of the Fair Map Amendment. I worked side by side with Representative Ryan Spain and we worked across the aisle to, to work on getting Fair Map legislation um, on the ballot. Unfortunately, COVID hit and that didn't happen. But when it comes to who I am and what I'm about, I'm the, pro I'm the mother of three beautiful daughters, I'm a small business owner, and I'm an attorney who represents our most vulnerable populations. And one thing I have always taught my kids is that you have to stand up for what's right, not what's easy, and it's not always easy to do that. But I did that when the corruption, when the ComEd um, scandal broke. I came out and said that the speaker needed to resign. I didn't, I did it immediately, not a few weeks later, I did it immediately. And that has caused a lot of problems for me, absolutely, by individuals who are my colleagues, who are unhappy within my own party, with people in the community who were surprised that I was able to do that. And obviously my campaign has been impacted by that as well, but I've taught my daughters to stand up for what's right. I find it ironic that Peter would bring up um, the ComEd uh, corruption, given how much money he's taken from ComEd, and by the fact that he actually voted for the bill that is, uh, is in question as we speak. However, that's who Peter is, fear, scare tactics. That's not what I'm about. I'm about building a bigger table here in Illinois, and more importantly, in our community. Thank you. Peter, um care to respond to the fear scare tactics uh, point that your opponent makes well it, it's not fear and scare tactics to point out how your opponent has lied to the people and actually lied to this editorial board very specifically if you go back i pulled it up uh, the other day her 2018 editorial board questionnaire for the daily herald um, and, uh, and I didn't check the Shaw Media one, and I'm sorry, I, I should have, uh, uh, Bob. Uh, but the Daily Herald one said very specifically, I will not vote for the income tax hike uh, amendment unless it's part of an overall uh, measure of, uh, of full reform. And I know, because I, you know, obviously folks in Springfield still come and, and call me, uh, I know that uh, the representative was running around Springfield saying, I committed to vote against it, I committed to vote against it. But Madigan put the arm on her and she voted for it. Uh, so broke that promise. And whether you're for it or against it, be honest, be upfront. Uh, and so that's part of, part of the issue. That, that's, not, that's not fear and scare tactics. It's you told people you were going to be one way and then you did the other. You told this editorial board, the Daily Herald at least, uh, I'll, I'll vet Madigan. I'm going to vet him. And well, the vetting apparently didn't come out very well because everybody in the state knows he's corrupt as hell, knew that 2018, we knew it, 2019, we knew it all the way up until the ComEd thing. The nice thing about ComEd was now we have it now in you know, stark detail. Here's, here's one example with one company of how we do the shakedown, of how the Democrats do the shakedown in the state. Um, and then even here, she just said it again. On the day the ComEd prosecution came out, she issued one of those if true statements. It was 10 days later that she flipped around and said, oh, no, no, I want him down now. I want him gone altogether. And then, except I, I then got, you know, these from my, my 
friends and neighbors, mail pieces, all paid for Democratic Party of Illinois. And then here's the one that ties me to child molesters, child molesters. So um, look, the dirty campaigning, the scare tactics are all there. Look, I, I don't have the money she's got. Uh, she's got the access to Madigan's millions. You know, I mean, I, I don't have a mail piece out yet because I don't have that. I don't have that kind of cash. So the issue for this editorial board, these editorial boards is, are you going to take somebody who lied to you, lied to the people, they're angry about it. I know because I talked to them at the doorstep and reward that person with another term in office. Um, now, ComEd very specifically, I'm, <laughs> the Future Energy Jobs Act was something that, go back and look at the record. I'm, I was on the Energy Committee. I was on the most important committees in the House. I was on the Energy Committee. I voted against it initially because it had too many corporate bailouts. We then got the bill fixed. And the bill was then signed into law by the Republican Governor Rauner, who's not exactly known for ComEd corruption or being affiliated in any way with Michael Madigan. So what I was able to do, as also being the only electrical engineer in the entire General Assembly and the only guy with an engineering degree in the Illinois House, was to make a considered view of how do we bring forward a, a clean energy future, which necessarily has to include nuclear, because you can't get enough uh, base capacity out of uh, wind and solar. You just can't get there. Um, we passed that bill into law. I mean, I, I had a 100% environmental rating, which my opponent will talk about, I'm assuming, if you ask more questions about environmentalism. I had that 100% rating in part because I helped shepherd that legislation through and because it was good for the state. Now, did ComEd have to get stuff? Well, apparently they had to get a little more than, than we had understood. You know, we didn't realize that they were, you know, paying off everybody in Madigan's army, um, you know, including Mike McLean, who moved money to Tara Costa Howard at the end of the, uh, the 20th century. You know what, election. Peter, let's, 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 okay, I'd like to ask a question. But that's it. So are that's there the time thing. limits on the questions? And then again, yeah. are we going to continue to allow Peter sure. to tell lies? Um, I mean, no, really... Which one's a lie? Which one is a lie? Identify uh, it because really, I just Peter, identified three. I, I'd like the, I'd like the editorial ahead. board. I'd like to just ask that simple question. Are we, is there a time limit? I just want to make deal. sure that I'm following and, the rules of what, of what this is about. Look, you asked me about the Future Energy I, Jobs again, Act. I'm sorry. I, I asked okay, let's let Bob answer the question. question. Sure. I, 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 at first, um, we've done a few of these. This is moving in a direction a little different maybe than some of the others. And I, I thought it might be good to let you guys kind of drive it for a little bit, you know, okay. and respond. But I do have several questions we both do that we want to ask about COVID, about police reform, about ethics. We'd like, to, um, Jim would like to get into the ethics reform question in a moment. I think in fairness though, um, Tara, if we could have you, give you an opportunity to respond to uh, the variety of things Peter has put forth and then maybe um, I'll let Jim shift into the ethics reform uh, topic. Would that be okay? okay. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Absolutely. So fair, first of all, I'd like to address the issue of the income tax and what I told my voters. What I have consistently said, and, and I stand by that, and again, if we want to look at what I voted for, I voted to put the fair tax amendment on the ballot because the voters should make that decision, not myself as a legislator. And that's what my voters, what my constituents had asked for, to have the opportunity to vote on that piece of legislation. If you look at the second piece of that legislation, it, re it talks about what those brackets were going to be. And as you know, I voted no to the brackets. It wasn't tied, in my opinion, to property tax reform. So I voted no on the brackets. As for vetting um, this, so I would say to suggest that I was strong armed into voting for something that I didn't vote for is not true. Um, as it comes to vote, vetting our candidates uh, for a speaker, um, that was the only candidate that came forward was, was Speaker Madigan. Um, I'm a Democrat. I'm not going to vote for a Republican. Wait, Jim Durkin. I'm going to vote for my candidate for my party, and there was one. In terms of party payment, I, I appreciate Peter mentioning mailers because again, if you take a look at what mailers have been sent out, the mail pieces that have come to our mailbox, I think there's three or four of them, have been paid for by the Illinois Republican Party. So as the Democratic candidate, and I'm proud to be a Democrat, 
I think it behooves me to, say, to suggest that I shouldn't take my party's support. Of course, I am a Democrat and I appreciate the support of my party, as I would presume that Peter, as a Republican, uh, maybe a Trump Republican, but he still takes the uh, money and the support from his party. Um, I would suggest that the Mike McLean comment is unnecessary and really quite demeaning, Peter, to suggest that Mike McLean had access to my bank accounts. Again, Peter, enough of the fear tactics and the inflammatory language. The fact that you can't even talk about my record, sorry, we don't need the fear tactics. The people of the 48th district are much smarter than that. Go ahead, I'm so sorry. I, I know- no, That's okay, right. but let's move in. I mean, that's and, and use this as kind of a springboard to, to something that's a little bit more specific and related to both your record and, um, and the legislature in general on this topic, the topic of ethics, the topic of the speaker who is under um, investigation. Um, and I guess, uh, Representative, like, I'd like you to start and talk about um, whether the legislature has given uh, ethics reform lip service or has given it uh, the uh, respect that it's due and, and what needs to be done to, I mean, ethics reform has been talked about for ages in Illinois. Um, and this year we got a commission that hasn't met for a long time. Um, what can you do to, uh, to get something more and, and do we need something? And can sure. you also include the discussion about whether the speaker should even stay where he is, uh, given the circumstances? Right. So let me start with that. Um, as I've said, as my statement has been crystal clear, I believe Speaker Madigan needs to resign as Speaker of the House, and I believe he needs to resign as the, as the chairman of the Illinois Democratic Party. This is a question about leadership, and this is not a criminal investigation, but for me, this is about leadership. And we, I don't put my trust in him as a leader at this time. He, he either knew what was going on and did nothing, or what would be even more alarming to me is that you had people in your administration who were doing these things, who they've admitted that they've done these things, and you didn't know about it. That's not a good leader, and, and I do not support that. I've been very vocal that I would not support him um, if his name comes forward uh, in 2021. Regarding ethics reform, I agree. There's been a lot of conversation. Um, since my time in office, we've really only had one real conversation about an ethics, ethics reform package. The question that I asked when I address any piece of legislation, and particularly here in ethics reform, is what is the goal? What is the behavior that we're trying to stop, um, to curtail? We have to know what that is in terms of what, what type of ethics reform legislation um, we need to address. When um, we have financial disclosure forms, do we need to be tighter? Do we need um, more requirements on what that is? Um, we talk about um, term limits for our leadership. Well, I, I believe that we should have term limits for our leadership, but I also think perhaps we're going to need to do that like the Senate did and address that in our rules committee. If we pass legislation that includes it, great, but if not, we need to deal with that in the rules committee. Um, another piece of ethics reform that I believe that we need to, to take a look at is fair maps. I was the chief sponsor of that legislation. I've been working, I worked with Change Illinois to make that happen. And I do believe that if COVID had not occurred, I was getting my hearing on that. I'd already spoken to the, um, to the chair of, of, of the committees um, to make sure that my legislation got a fair hearing. And I believe that that would have happened. It was a great piece of legislation that was bipartisan. Um, and, and that is because our, the community, voters need to choose who their legislators, who their elected officials are going to be, not those of us who are ready in office. We need to be able to elect ethical people, ethical leaders, ethical legislators, not people who sue the state of Illinois because they don't like a bill that passed. Once we pass legislation, it's our responsibility to move that stuff forward. 
I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of the ethics reform package um, that the committee has been working on. I have spoken not only to my Democratic colleagues about it, but I also reach out to the Repub my Republican colleagues because I, this to me is bipartisan. Um, I think it's important for me to understand where the Republican Party is coming on it and, and see where, so that it is not a party issue, that this is about true and real ethics reform. Peter? Yeah. Response. Uh... All right, I, I I'm I'm taking notes uh, just to try to try to make sure I cover the same topics. Um, so in terms of Madigan, uh, I called for him to resign, step down after the at least after the uh, the rape cover up uh, with uh, that involved Mike McLean, you know, key top lieutenant for Madigan, again uh, the guy that in the secret emails re revealed on November 21st of 2019 by the Chicago Tribune that he'd had a secret project for his magic lobbyist list uh, that uh, funneled money, you know, Tara Costa Howard and other uh, vulnerable House Democrats. Uh, now, the reason I, you know, look, Tara made the promise. She said, oh, in 2021, I won't support him. The problem is she made the same promise two years ago to people at their doorstep. And there was a way to go without voting for Mike Madigan. It's called the present vote. It's what Ann Stava Murray did out of Downers Grove. And the reason I know, you know, Jim Cafferty, out of Elmhurst two years ago. Honorable. Peter, I'm sorry, we're, we don't have a lot of time. I wonder if you could sure. talk about what ethics reform should look like in Illinois right. and how we get to ethics reform. And, and I, I, okay, I just want to make sure that we get the Madigan thing clear that folks that didn't vote for Madigan didn't get support from the Democratic Party of Illinois, which he fully controls. The ethics reform issues here, term limits is the no-brainer, number one, easy. Uh, I don't understand why Ms. Costa Howard won't support that. Uh, straight up term limits for legislators. Most of these guys, short of, I believe Tom Cullerton didn't, you know, he was, he's the one guy that wouldn't have been swept up in uh, term limits reform. Every other one of them was serving in double digit years uh, that has been indicted or raided or implicated in some way. Term limits would get rid of those bad actors altogether. Now, lobbying limits, for heaven's sakes, all of the lobby, any lobbying limit, I think I answered this in the, the editorial questionnaire, whatever the, whatever the United States Constitution allows, that length of time should be what it is. 10 years, five years, two years, no more uh, legislating and then turning around into a sweetheart lobbyist gig. Uh, now, in terms of uh, fair maps, uh, the representative said that she talked to the chairs of the committees that would hear it. The problem is I just went on the ILGA website just as we were talking right here and saw the thing never got out of rules committee because it wasn't going anywhere. It was designed not to go anywhere. It was raised two months before the deadline, not two years before. The only way we're going to get fair maps in the state is not to have, you know, these kind of sham things. In 2016, Jack Franks did the same thing. He was allowed to even bring it to the floor. I remember debating it. He got even a vote on it because they knew full well they weren't gonna let it go into law. They weren't gonna let it go to the voters. The only way to do this was actually a fair maps, you know, community uh, uh, effort that would have to go on the ballot uh, uh, from the people. So I actually started that effort, a citizen initiative. Um, I wish the representative had supported me there. It would have been nice. That could have actually gotten the job done. Uh, we had it legally vetted, you know, six ways from Sunday and would really and truly get fair maps done. I'd urge this editorial board uh, after this election to look at it, because I think that's the way that you're going to have to deal with this going forward, because the parties and the General Assembly itself can't be trusted to do it on its own. So those are my answers on ethics. If I may, just quick response. Um, I wasn't in the legislature two years ago, and I would suggest talking to Madeline Jubeck and the board of directors at Change Illinois about the work that I did with them to actually make fair maps occur. The question that kind of came to mind to this first 30 minutes for me, and having done some other uh, interviews, there seems to be a, and of course this is a rematch from two years ago, a certain level, I don't know if you'd agree or not, of contentiousness between the two of you in this and positions and maybe getting a little bit personal, I, I don't know. Tara, could you uh, address that and we'll have Peter uh, follow up with his thoughts. Sure, I, you know, I think that it feels contentious um, because Peter keeps trying to say I lied, to try to slam me. If you notice I haven't, that's not what I say. That's not what I do. I'm standing on 
my record. Um, and, and I'm proud of it. And I'm proud of what's gone on in the district. Drive around, see the number of yard signs, but more importantly, talk to the people in the village. Talk to the people, our village managers, our, our park districts, our boards, our communities. The people that I meet with talk about it all the time. I'm out there. I'm, I'm, I'm in the community. I have attended hundreds of events. I have hosted numerous coffees. I've been in every single part of my district to make sure that I understand what that is. Peter didn't do that, okay? So Peter doesn't wanna talk about the good things that I've done for the community because they're things that Peter never did. I'll just take the hotel motel bill for as an example. Peter was a sponsor of it and he couldn't get it passed, but I did. That's what it means to represent your community and to get things done. Okay. Bring your, your response. Frankly, okay, the reason that I'm having to handle unemployment insurance claims is because her office is a hot mess. Okay. That's not true, Peter, and you know You're, it. You weren't even returning phone calls to a constituents. All right, Peter, I, I, if you could just. I'm, I'm sorry. Look, you know what? She wants to come out. Look, here, here's the deal. Right. And frankly, Bob, there's only one rematch in the entire state of Illinois that I know of. I mean, maybe there's another one somewhere. I, this I, is the only one in the suburbs, as far as I know. And the only reason I'm doing it, I mean, look, I got a little baby. I have a thriving national law practice. I didn't want to do this. But frankly, I'm looking at the state going, it's on fire. And yeah, and, and you know what? I am the challenger. And frankly, I enjoy being the challenger. I've never actually, I've always been the underdog. I've won, you know, I'd won every election I'd ever, you know, done uh, before this one. And I was usually the underdog, you know, took out Sandy Pijos, even my village board race. I was supposed to lose that big time and won it by double digits. So yeah, and you know what? The way you do it is, is you create contrast because you go to the door and I talk to people and they were saying, yeah, she came to my door. She told me she'd be against Matting, and then all of a sudden she went the other way. I voted for her. You put your yard sign in, Peter. Okay. So that's right. that's not contentiousness. That's creating a distinction. Okay. And this I'm district. To that. I didn't know if yeah. contentious I mean, look, was necessarily the right word. But, yeah, I, but I but I will say, I mean, look, when when we had horrific property tax valuations come in at the end of last year, in part because I mean it was state law and, and there was some, you know, I, I'm not blaming anybody. I held emergency property tax town halls, wasn't intending to, and I helped people get their property taxes lowered. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that was something that, you know, look, there was nothing going on with their state representative. And again, I have handled, I'm handling like people with their FOID cards. These poor people are like three months, six months, and, and they're not getting an answer from their, their state representative. The unemployment insurance claims, I've got people I could, I could probably, I mean, I don't know if they'll go on the record with the paper, but maybe they would who would tell you they got no help from their representative and they got help from me. So, I, I mean, look, I, 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 what it I, is. Love to, I would love an opportunity to respond to that. Cause again, maybe, 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 very quickly, I'd like to move on to the topic. I mean, really. It's been really great. 30, first 30 minutes really helps um, the viewers kind of get a definition of both candidates, you know, contrast, as you said, Mr. Breen, but we do need to move to some other questions that we had prepared for, for every race. And I'm going to let Jim, kind of carry us in that direction with our next topic. Well, I'd like to move to COVID-19 because obviously that's something that is going to affect us in many different ways. And, and I'm curious, um, and Representative Howard, let's start with, with you. Uh, uh, how has the response of the governor been so far and what role should the legislature play in how we, um, how we address COVID-19 going forward. So I believe that the governor has been a leader, not just in the state of Illinois, but across the nation in our COVID response. Um, he made a lot of tough decisions. They haven't been popular everywhere across the state. And I, and I understand that. And, and I'll be honest, some of them haven't been popular here in the district. That said, I still think that um, as the leader of the state of Illinois, he needed to make those choices and decisions for us. I wish the legislature had been a little bit more, had had more of an opportunity to be more involved, not so much in the decisions because ultimately that is his to make, but in some of the communication pieces of it. My office has been handling um, calls for months on unemployment, for example, months of those phone calls, trying to help people to address those types of issues. And part of that was um, we then saw in the 2020 budget that we put forward and our response to that. 
It's my responsibility as a legislator to go to the governor and his staff and to advocate for the things that are needed in my district. I did just that. As we were working on, as they were working on the stages of different things and how we were going to reopen, one of the things that I did is I met with our local, um, with many of our local pastors of some of our religious institutions because they were concerned about how are we going to be able to get back online to open up some of our churches. So what do I do? I meet with them. We, we do that virtually. They come up with a great plan of how they're going to be able to do that. And I bring that to the governor then and to try to get them to make those changes, to advocate for what's happening in my district. That's my responsibility, not suing the state of Illinois. I'm there to work with people, not against them. Peter? All right. And, and you know, the governor's grade is going to be incomplete until we figure out what's going on after the fact. You know, we don't know, you know, was there, were there mistakes made in, the, in the, the nursing homes? We're not sure. You know, I know in New York, that's become a big issue here in Illinois. We're not sure. All we know is that our disabled and our seniors have really been put upon uh, by the COVID pandemic, especially in our state. Uh, my real issues with the governor, and I guess with the representative, would be where our small businesses were so negatively impacted. And in particular, our small enterprises were shut down. They weren't allowed to sell their items, but then Walmart and Target were able to sell those same items. And so you saw no real uh, attempt to try to support your local retailers. And, and I heard nothing, at least nothing in the public from our representative about that. Now, uh, she mentioned churches. Uh, you know, one I'll tell you, you know, a lot of folks have been bringing lawsuits to try to make sure that their interests are protected. I sued the state of Illinois three times on behalf of three different church, church groups uh, in order to ensure that they were treated equally as, so the churches were treated the same as the liquor stores, the law offices, and other interests of a similar nature, manufacturing firms, et cetera. Each time we brought a lawsuit, Governor Pritzker adjusted his executive order back. He pulled back every single time. And after the third lawsuit, he then pulled his restrictions entirely and said, hey, I am going to finally respect the free exercise of religion. And because of that, we now are able to attend church safely, which we're doing. Sacred Heart Church, we've got plexiglass and all sorts of things going on there. Uh, you know, you get sanitized several times uh, at, you know, during the service. Uh, it's very... Uh, it's unique. We're looking forward to having that end, but it's just good to be able to be, go back to church. Uh, now, in terms of how we can move forward, you know, we are a lot of the way through this. We're six months in. Uh, I, I think one of the main things I'm hearing from people, and I attended a rally the other night, uh, the Reopen the Schools rally. You had a lot of kids speaking at that rally and their parents. Uh, and now that we've gotten the parochial schools have been open now for, I mean, I think it's almost a month for some of them. Other states have been open. Western Europe is open on the schools. We've got to work a little more to get at least our grade schools open and then to get our high schools open as quickly as we can, because those kids are really, really being put upon. You know, there was a young man uh, who spoke at the rally. It was an African American. What do we use as the standards we, to make the decision to, to do those sorts of things? I mean, well, is it... We have, so, so here, here's the thing. Every school district's a little different. Every school is a little different. Uh, we have very well-paid administrators who are charged with putting those plans together. You know, I have a family member who's a teacher and she's going, how is it that my administrator, and I'm not gonna you know, name names, uh, you know, which, who it is, it's not in our district, but how is it that they don't have a plan six months in? Uh, and I know, again, our parochial schools locally are open. They have been open now for several weeks. Other states, and then Western Europe. Uh, the issue is, if you, if you make the commitment to get open and you figure out how do we do it, and again, grade schools seem like they're easier in terms of the, the, you know, the, the way to do it than the high schools, although there are different challenges for both. Uh, but for me, that, I mean, look, the, the ideas are out there, the concepts are out there, you've got to though push through because the kids, uh, they desperately wanna go back to school and it's, and it's time to give the parents that, uh, that, that option to send their children back to school. The other thing, though, is soon enough, we're going to be past this. And what COVID did was it exposed the fundamental weaknesses of what Illinois government has done to our small business community, to our business community generally. I saw that the, the article just came out that, that the, the folks leaving the state has actually increased 
during the pandemic. So now we're up to 67% of the United Van Lines movers are moving out versus moving in. Uh, I know a lot of homes are turning over in our in our communities. Uh, you know, you know, and so that that's you know people are are moving at a pretty pretty good clip. Um, and so all of that together, you've got to support your small businesses. And I've pointed out, you know, my opponent had run on a small business platform, but when the NFIB ratings came out, she was 25%. So against small business, 75% of the time, I was consistently at 100 and they've endorsed me in this race. Supporting our small businesses is going to be the way to really uh, help us to get out of COVID. And again, the tax hikes and all the extra spending are not the way uh, to get us out of COVID. Jim, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd really appreciate an opportunity to respond to a number of those things as, as I got a chance to speak first. So um, regarding our, thank you, um, regarding our small businesses, the 2020 budget actually had quite a bit of assistance in there for our small business. And as you know, Peter constantly says how he doesn't support that budget. I did support that budget. I didn't say it was pretty, but I supported it because we need to get people back online. We need that opportunity to help and do everything we can to help our small businesses. I spent a lot of time during COVID doing several things. One, we were making calls every single day to the seniors in our district to make sure they had what they need, whether that was a grocery run, um, just even having that human contact to have phone contact with people because we thought it was that important. In addition to that, though, I was on the phone with our small business center owners. Um, you know, the, the mom and pops, the places that are open in our community, those restaurants and those little clothing stores. Um, bookshops that are that are in our communities that the, uh, that are the heart and soul of what it means to live out here in the suburbs. I had that opportunity to talk to them and work with them and help them identify the things that they were going to need, which included the different stages and what were the things that they were going to need to be able to open. As you know, in our local communities, we'll talk, we can talk about the restaurants that were able to open because of my advocacy and the tents and the outdoor dining that we were able to pass cocktails to go so that our little, um, so that some of our small cocktail bars that again are in our small communities are able to open open and continue to do that. I couldn't agree more how COVID, um, <laughs> how COVID addressed the weaknesses that we have in our system and things that happen. And I got to say, thank you to Peter for bringing that up because that happened over the four years of 736 days of no budget, which Peter was a part of and part of the Rauner administration, not voting for those budgets, not supporting those things, where our state departments were absolutely decimated. Our public services were absolutely decimated. So here we are in 2019 trying to get all those things back line back online COVID hits and again the glaring holes Peter wants to talk about void cards and guns I think I think we've moved away from responding to his points and I, 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 I about some other questions up. I wanted to follow up with you on something sure. I had been thinking about but but Peter sort of introduced it at the, toward the beginning um, I think we all hear from I don't have any hard data but I think we all hear at some point from a friend or a relative or, or, or a, a colleague, I'm getting out of the state. I'm not living here. The, the politics, the, 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 the economy, this, that, and I'm going to Indiana, whatever the case may be, we, we've all heard it. As, as the incumbent, can you discuss a little bit what is being done um, and what you'd like to see done to make this an attractive state, to, to make it a state where people want to stay and further how we can draw more people into our state both you know residents as well as as businesses what, what what's going on in that regard sure absolutely if you take a look at the numbers particularly here in dupage county and the 48th district they're stable numbers so we can talk about people leaving the state of illinois and what we see is central and southern illinois um they are losing num they they have a population decrease I, I i have no i have no problem i understand that but here in dupage county that's not what we're seeing. In fact, our communities are actually flourishing. So no matter how many times we say it's horrible to live here in Illinois, people are still coming to Illinois. One of the things that I've been doing with the, the Downers Grove Economic Development Commission, uh, Michael Casa, the director, is to talk about what are some of the things that we can do to attract those businesses, right? Um, again, that Downers Grove corridor has, we have hotels, but it's about 
having the opportunity to build up our suburbs in a way so that industry is moving out to the suburbs. People, we are attracting people to our communities. So those are improvements in our infrastructures, transportation, rail lines, bus lines. Another piece of that is affordable housing. Um, and how we define affordable may look a little different depending on where we live. However, here in DuPage County, and particularly here in the 48th, that is, a bit, that is a big focus, is how to make sure that people can live and stay in their homes um, and that they want to come out here. One of the other reasons that I believe um, that we need to continue, things that we need to continue to do, um, is our public education system out here in the suburbs. If we are, we have to make, I'm proud of the public educations out here in the suburbs, um, and particularly here in DuPage County. There are some not only in the top in the state, but at top districts across the nation. These are things that people are looking at when they're moving here. I have to be honest with you, right across the street from my house is a family, a brand new family that just moved in with a baby. They moved here because of the excellent schools. They moved here because of the proximity to the train station. They moved here because industry really is booming. Um, I'm being, I have been supported by the Illinois Manufacturers Association. I use that as an example because we are doing things to help small business here in Illinois. We need to continue down that path. And I do believe that people are going to stay. Okay. All right. <laughs> A lot there. Uh, first off, DuPage County has still lost people. Uh, during these past 10 years, uh, and not overall, but we have been lost people during some of the more recent years. Uh, the problem you're running into is we're the only place left to live in this state. Cook County is depopulating. Central, Southern Illinois, depopulating. That is not leading to a sustainable future for our whole state. So this is one of those places where, oh, my district is just fine as everything else is burning is not a good way of going. So you're being elected to represent, you know, in the state legislature, yes, the district, but you've got to represent the interests of the state. The problems of, it's not the last four years, but the last 40 years, is we've let our tax burden rise. We've put burdens on our businesses. And frankly, our corruption burden has continued to increase because no one will take out the corrupt structure. And even now, you know, once Madigan goes, his structure is still there. All the people are still there. The, the way things at work is still there. That is what is causing people to leave. You know, did we get some small business support out of the last budget? Sure, but that's money coming from the federal government that only an idiot wouldn't have spent in the way the federal government told you to do it for the most part. Uh, but that didn't mean that we needed to hike state worker pay $261 million. We didn't need to spend more money than we've ever spent in this last budget. Folks who are leaving, and, and look, are people leaving because of the educational system? No, because we've got, you know, look, when I moved here, when my family moved here to find economic opportunity 30, 34 years ago, we had great schools. And today we have great schools. So, okay, that's not why people are leaving, obviously. Uh, and when you look at that, you, you can't, say, oh, well, hey, you know, there's folks moving in. I'm right, yeah, there are people breaking their leases in the city, desperate to get out here because we're safe. We're the one of the last safe places left. We are also though, if we're the only one left, we become the piggy bank for the rest of the state of Illinois. And then you see these tax hikes coming down the pike, you've got problems. Uh, so all of that together, you've got no solutions coming out of the Democratic Party generally, out of our representatives specifically, again, other than, Oh, hey, you know, 25% business rating where you've, you've put more and more burdens on small business. There's a reason I'm endorsed. I mean, I don't know. I don't know of any other, I don't know which groups have endorsed me, but I know the Illinois Chamber has and the NFIB. So the folks that actually have an interest in bringing business to the state, growing new business and helping folks flourish to create jobs so that we can come back. Our unemployment rate lags the rest of the country. Our economic uh, growth rate lags the rest of the country. And we have the worst tax burden in the country. So there you go. Okay, um, I think we've gotten through most of our questions, but I did want to pose this. Uh, we're running a bit short on time, so I'll ask you guys to keep it brief. But uh, Mr. Breen, if uh, returned to the legislature, your top couple of uh, legislative priorities would be what? Well, you know, again, I, I, when I decided to run for this, I, I 
took on the, the campaign theme, Clean House, Rebuild Illinois. Uh, because it can't just be a clean house of Madigan and the corruption and all of that. Uh, you do also then need to focus on the future, on the rebuilding. And the way you do that is you rein in the spending, you pull back all the reins on, on business that we've put on them, all these terrible burdens that we've put on them. And then you, know, you, you then work to repopulate the state, to make this a destination. And we've had so much over the years, so much that, that's been put on people You've got to turn that tide around. People need to get the message from the General Assembly that, hey, we're changing. This whole thing is going to be different if, you know, and, and to invite people to come in and be here and stay here. And, you know, all of that together is, is the way that you, you turn this whole thing around. You know, when I was there, within, you know, after two years in the legislature, they made me the floor leader, the lead debater against, the Mad, against Madigan and his agenda. So you know that if I go down there, things change. My voice will be heard. Our voice, our district's voice will be heard. And so that is something, look, I mean, I, I talked to reporters that said, we miss you. You know, we wish we had somebody who would, you know, who had the ability to explain the bills the way you did, frame it up and make a compelling case for really, a, again, a more conservative way of looking at our budgeting and, and looking at the way that we can govern uh, and so that, that is what I would be able to do uh, if you send me back. Representative, I'll pose the same question to you. Thank you. Um, when the people of 20, when the people of 48th District, again, they elected me in 2018, they sent the message for change. I believe that they're going to, I trust that they will continue to do that and send that message again with me back to Springfield. We have a lot of work to do. We're still cleaning up the mess from the four rounder years when Mr. Breen was there, where everything was just about decimated. Um, it's interesting because my Republican colleagues talk about it that way too, and how grateful that they were that I was there with them, as well as my Democratic colleagues, because I brought a fresh perspective, a fresh voice that wasn't about party, it was about my community and bringing back to the community the actual voice of the people here. One of the things that I definitely want to work on, um, are, well, I should say there's a lot of things I have um, on my schedule to work on, obviously. One, again, is an environment. Um, we want to have clean air, clean water, clean soil for not just ourselves, but for generations to come he here in Illinois. Um, I also want to work on um, things like paid family leave. That is something that is important. And I think what's gone on with COVID has highlighted that need to know that families don't have to go to work sick because they're afraid that they're not gonna be able to get paid and they need to make pay their bills. That is something that is very, very important to me. When we talk about rebuilding Illinois, um, Illinois is a great state. I'm proud to have been born here and lived here my entire life. And when we talk about rebuilding Illinois, it's not about, re it's about rebuilding the infrastructure. Absolutely, our roads, our bridges. That's what we did in 2019, but with our capital bill. We were able to rebuild and bring those things back and, and lift that up here in the state of Illinois. I wanna build a bigger table, not a smaller table, a bigger table, so that more people have an opportunity to have their voice be heard. I'm listening to them. Again, I have hold, held so many different coffees and events, um, property tax assessment seminars with all three of our property tax assessors from, from the township from which I'm a part of. I knock those doors. I make those phone calls because I'm listening to what they have to say. And that is the voice that I am bringing to Springfield. We need some positive. We need to be heard. That's what I am about. We can build a bit bigger table here in the 48th district and around the state of Illinois when I'm reelected. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jim, any other uh, follow-up questions or, or things you'd like to bring up before I, I we- think we're good. We're good? Okay. All right. Um, then that then will we'll conclude the um, endorsement uh, interview conducted collaboratively between the Daily Herald and, and Shaw Media. I want to thank both the candidates today, uh, Peter Breen, Tara Costa Howard, for participating. The election is the 3rd of November. Early voting begins 24th of September. Um, that will include uh, mail in voting this year. We encourage everyone to look to 
Shaw Media and the Daily Herald as they do their research on uh, the candidates on the ballot. Um, I want to thank you both again. Jim, thanks for your participation and uh, good luck to both of uh, the candidates in uh, the remaining days until, uh, until November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. It's good to talk to you. Yes, you're very welcome. Bye-bye.